Welcome to Script Camp's first page of your novel class. Oh, sorry, this is Word Camp. Welcome to Word Camp's first page of your novel class. Um, this is going to be a class that's both um, breaking down techniques that authors use to hook and keep the audience reading in those first few pages, and we're also going to break down the first pages from some great published books to sort of see what we notice and what we learn, and we can analyze those um, to draw out the best techniques from those that we can use in our own work. Um, so let's get started, because we've got plenty to do. So, <clears throat> this is part of WordCamp. We are a writing community that is focused on taking you from concept to complete manuscripts. We've got lots of free classes and events and workshops with a bunch coming up just this week. Or, sorry, the, in the following weeks, I should say. Um, every Saturday from 12 to 2, you'll find some event going on in the server uh, for the next month or so until our new boot camp starts. We have some paid classes as well, like the VIP member classes, the boot camps, and the Writer's Lab. We're part of Skill Camp, which is a nonprofit organization that brings free and low cost classes to help you master skills you need to reach your life goals. We've got new classes coming soon with your Script Camp membership. So um, if you haven't already come by our main primary server, which is called Script Camp, you should join that one. And on that one, we announce a lot of the other big events happening on the other servers too. But you should join these other Discord communities if you're interested in things like filmmaking over on Film Camp, Creator Camp for home content creation, such as YouTube. Uh, we have Toon Camp for animation. Word Camp for Novels, Design Camp for Graphic Design, and Code Camp for Coding, which already has a weekly event that you can come by. It has Coding Boot Camp this Sundays at noon, I think Joel said yesterday. These times are all in Pacific time. So, plenty of things coming up that you can see here. We have our new boot camps uh, for TV and feature writing that are starting soon. We've got we're about halfway to go of our current uh, cycle of those, but in three to four weeks, you can expect new TV and feature classes that will take you all the way from idea to finished draft of a brand new script for a pilot or a feature film. We all, we'll be having new script analysis uh, classes coming in February too. New fiction classes that'll be throughout uh, the rest of February in WordCamp on Saturday, so at noon, and we have a new novel boot camp that will be starting. It's actually not February 11th, but the week after that, that will be the 18th. Um, plenty of other things happen on a weekly basis here. On our right-hand side, you can see just a list of all of the ongoing, currently, uh, you know, the currently recurring events. Currently recurring? The recurring events. Um, we have Horror Workshop Tuesdays at 6, Fantasy Workshop Sundays at 5. Those are just the, some of the genre groups that we have here. We've also just recently added a Women Writers Group, which is going to be, be meeting Sundays at 10, and a Queer Writers Group right before that, Sundays at 9. We have Table Reads. Sundays from 2 to 5, two different script swaps per week on Tuesday and Wednesday, and plenty of other stuff that you can try out and check out, so make sure to come by Script Camp and you'll see most of those announcements. And on each of these pages during the classes, then you can expect to find these classes on the server that corresponds to the color that you see it written in here, so purple means Toon Camp, teal means Word Camp. Um, you can find a lot of this on the Script Camp server, so make sure to just check that announcements page and the events tab to find out what's going on in any given week. Um, here's just a little tiny bit about me. I've been reading screenplay, writing the screenplays and novels for many years. Uh, I've been repped since 2017 in screenwriting, though I'm, I should point out I'm not repped in, uh, in uh, novel writing. I do not have an agent uh, for literary fiction, um, or I should say I don't have a literary agent for novels. Um, but in any case, I have been writing them for a long time, writing, querying fantasy, sci-fi, and horror books for the most part. I wrote for Shudder's Creep Show in 2019, so that should give you a sense of sort of the kind of thing I'm into in terms of my own work, uh, horror, thriller, action, things like that. Um, in terms of books, I am most interested in uh, horror and fantasy. So I have a thriller script set up with a production company in Hollywood, and I teach the boot camps and weekly writers labs. So that's going to be TV writing, feature writing, and I sometimes teach something else like a genre-based boot camp like sci-fi, or the novel boot camp in WordCamp, things like that. Um, so that's the basics. Let's look at the overview. This is subject to change, and I won't go through the entire thing, but this is just what the novel boot camp kind of looks like. Um, this is 12 weeks course, though um, we're, we're looking at maybe amending the, the span that it takes place, um, or the amount of time that it takes in the coming months. But in any case, this is our current uh, look at the schedule coming up. So starting February 18th, this will basically take you through writing an entire book in... 12 weeks. Um, so about the first half of this class is planning and learning about prose and your characters and building out the world and outlining really extensively. 
so that by the time you start, you have figured out what's going to happen in every chapter, more or less, as best you can, and you're going to be approaching the second half of the class with that really detailed roadmap for your whole story. So you're going to be writing about 10 to 15,000 words a week. All right, so here's a list of all the free classes coming up. Um, we've got best protagonist for your story, subplots in movies and TV shows, but that could also definitely apply to novels too. Novels, in fact, have way more subplots than movies and TV for the most part. We have that new intro session of the feature writing class on the 17th at 6 p.m., and a new session of the pilot class Sunday, March 5th at 11 a.m. That's going to be moving the schedule so that pilots will be on Sundays and features will be on Fridays. We alternate the days every time one of the class cycles has finished. Also, on WordCamp, on the right, you can see a list of all the stuff we have coming up here. Pretty soon, we have writing action and adventure. Um, the adventure genre of novels, which covers everything from things, you know, fantasy adventures like The Hobbit, to sometimes we look at pulp adventures, things, things more along the lines of Doc Savage or Indiana Jones. We have a query letter class on the 8th, which is both going to show you how to write a query letter for your book when it's finished and ready to start going out to literary agents. And also, it's a good technique to kind of just um, think of how to summarize your story uh, from the beginning. So you might start out by writing a query letter for your book and kind of use that to collate and organize the most important story information up front. We have a class with a QA with an editor, Max Higgins, on February 11th at noon. So come with your questions for a professional book editor. We have a new session of Novel Boot Camp on the 18th and an outlining class on the 22nd at 6 o'clock. These are all free and public classes. So we hope to see you here for a couple of these things coming up. Last, you can refer a friend. If you become a member of Script Camp, a subscriber, you can refer your friends, and they will get a free month of unlimited Script Camp as well. If they continue, then you will get a free month. So, um, And you'll also both get access to Arc Studio Pro, which is a great screenwriting software for a free month as well. So you can message me or Nacho if you'd like to refer someone that you know once you're a member. Okay, so, um, oh, and for all of this, if you'd like to sign up, remember, go to scriptcamp.net, and you can sign up for your free trial for membership. Just go to the membership tab up here, and you can get two weeks unlimited, which includes access to over, I think it must be 100 hours of live classes every single month at this point, with events, workshops, script swaps, and all kinds of writing-related uh, events online. Um, this also includes access to the video library, which is recordings of all of our previous classes. And um, you can get your two weeks by just clicking this free trial button here. Notice that you'll save about 40% if you get a yearly subscription instead. So again, the website is scriptcamp.net. Make sure to come by if you'd like to participate in more events like this. And also, if you, although all of our first sessions of the boot camps are free, if you'd like to continue beyond just that very first class and go from idea to finished draft, um, whether it's a script, feature, book, play, or anything else, then um, make sure to sign up for your subscription. Okay, so let's look at the overview for today's class. We're, we'll be talking about first pages, um, which means we won't really be getting into structure because you can't really structure a, a uh, beyond, the, if we're just looking at, at the scope of the first page, then we're not going to be looking at the midpoint or the break into Act 3 or any of these things. We're going to be more looking at kind of how to hook a reader and keep them interested and invested in reading past that first page, which really is just going to be a couple paragraphs. Um, we look mostly at word counts in terms of books and not page counts because typesetting and different faces and fonts and things will kind of change the layout in every single edition and, and version of the book that they do. So we, we can usually imagine that a page is about 250 to 300 words, depending on the, um, you know, the size of the font and everything like that, and the spacing between the words and the kerning and all that stuff. But in any case, it's going to be like two to three paragraphs for the most part. So you might imagine 250 to 350 words is what we're looking at here. And so in this very short span of time, it's kind of like an audition where you imagine somebody's going through the bookstore and they're looking through the first pages of everything that they might potentially be buying. And they're going to be deciding which one do I want to keep going and spend my money on and not maybe even, you know, I'll read the first page and that's enough for me to decide that I want to buy it. And then I'm going to go home and, and read the rest of it later. So that's what we're trying to do. We're dealing with these very fickle attention spans of people that are doing essentially the equivalent of flipping through channels and uh, waiting till they see something that grabs them and pulls them in. So we kind of have to ask certain questions like what pulls me into a book? And of course you should be reading a lot of books if you want to be a novelist. There's no other way to get really good at this than by reading, writing, and 
finishing things and moving on to that next thing. Um, of course, with books as opposed to scripts, people do actually tend to spend way longer on them than they do on a script because it simply just takes way longer to write a book. And also, over time, a book can really sort of be developed and over draft after draft after draft, it's less of a fool's errand for the most part to rework a book for years as opposed to a script where it's like, if you don't nail it in six months or so, I usually recommend moving on. Books sometimes take longer than that, and a lot of authors are also just sort of writing in the time they have available to them. They're not necessarily trying to build a, a career as a screenwriter very quickly. They're trying to build a career as a novelist, which might take, you know, a much larger investment of your time. But in any case, this is all to say that that first page is so important to make sure that your reader is interested and intrigued enough to continue to spend their money on what you have to offer and to just try out you know give give you as an author a shot which means that if they're if they like the first book they might buy the second book so really we're just really we're very incentivized to write a slam dunk first page because if you don't then chances are people will stop reading it's as simple as that so we'll talk opening hooks today and this concept of conflict and how conflict in a book isn't always just going to be this person wants this thing and this person is trying to stop them like we usually think of it in movies and tv shows conflict can mean a lot of different things and can manifest in many different interesting ways on the page in a book in ways that it could never really do in a script because we're a non-visual medium our medium is entirely words and so that sense of conflict can make lots of different things interesting even if for instance watching it on tv would be very boring well so we'll look at opening hooks we'll look at conflict we're going to do just a brief a thing where I just say grab a novel from near you and just read out the first page so I would recommend maybe just look around the room and see if there's anything within reach and if anyone feels like they want to uh, read out that first page then we're not going to analyze them or break them down too closely we just kind of want to get into the feeling of what a first page um, should kind of seem like and what it feels like and, and we're kind of um, going to just hear some examples of first pages today we'll hear a lot of examples but we want to see a wide breadth of genres and different styles and approaches too so as you can see my examples that I'll be reading from today are, oh no, my I think my page is cut off a little bit. There we go. Um, are, I want to draw from a literary book, a war slash sci-fi book, a horror book, and a Western book. Um, that's four different genres, but that's all very much my area of interest. So if you have a different kind of novel genre near you, maybe you have a romance book or a biography or something like that, and you want to read out the first page of that, that would be the one to, um, you know, if you had to choose, pick one that is not one of the other genres that we'll be reading today. Um, so we'll be doing that. We'll, we'll look at a first page analysis guide and just things to be reading for and the questions to be asking yourself and answering, whether it's a different book that you're studying or whether it is a book of your own that you are trying to make the sharpest first page possible. We'll talk about the difference between floating, which is a word that I mostly use and um, a way that I conceive of the things that aren't just scenes in books like narration, for instance, or just talking about, I don't know, the weather or the time period or the country that we're in or things like this that aren't really a scene. Um, but we'll talk about the difference between that and how we sort of settle into scenes in books and we kind of like zero in on, imagine like the crane shot in a movie as the, the camera slowly drifting down from up high and it's finding a point of interest to kind of make it concrete and tangible and give us something to attach to and a character that we're watching do something. So we'll talk about that transition from floating into the concrete tangibility of a scene. And then last, we'll be breaking down different pages in different genres. We'll be looking at sections from Dogs of Babel by Carolyn Parkhurst. Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, The Ritual by Adam Neville, and Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. And then I realize that's a lot, so I might take, I might cut a few of those out if we have folks that want to share their own first pages for us, which was my sort of next question. If anyone has first pages from a work in progress that they want to share in class, can you let us know in the chat now so I can kind of plan for how much we have time to do? I know that Aliska said that she has one, so we have at least one. Does anyone else want to share a first page? will amanda will great okay i just i just have it ready to go it's quick it's three cool. paragraphs great okay um so we'll have at least two personally what was that i said so i'm just trying to take count of who how many that we'll have to do so i can adjust this the structure of the rest of the class so good to know we'll have oh, at least were you, oh i thought you were saying wanting to read a first page from a novel yeah we're doing that we're doing both so we're both oh, okay. reading first pages from novels just like within reach of you and then towards the end of class, we'll have time to share the first page from your own work in progress. Okay, got it, got it. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have time for both. Looks like no one else is chiming in, so we'll have two to, to, to break down and look at and just give a little feedback towards the end of class today. So I'll probably cut one of our examples just to make sure we have enough time. Okay, 
Um, so definitely, if you are planning on sharing, make sure you have it copied and pasted and or ready to copy and paste into their chat so we can read along as you read it out loud. Cool. Um, let's get started with all that stuff. Um, and let's first start by talking. Well, let's look at this again. So we'll start by going into opening hooks. We'll talk, co talk conflict and then we'll do the grab a novel thing. So maybe just find a book near you and get ready to read that first page. Let's talk opening hooks. So um, what is an opening hook? So the reader's going to judge in your first few pages whether or not they want to keep reading. Um, and if they're at a store or a library, <coughs> then um, they're going to put the book down and look for something else if, those first, if that first page doesn't usually grab them or intrigue them to keep going. Very rarely is someone actually going to give you that benefit of the doubt. Maybe if they are a big fan of your other stuff, or they're a huge fan of the subject matter of your book and they're like really into Renaissance history and your book is set in the Renaissance, then they might give you a little extra time. But regardless, like, you really have to imagine that if you're not drawing them in, then you're pushing them away. A lot of things, though, can be interesting in a book in many different ways. This is a non-visual medium, so you don't really have to start on an explosion or a car chase to keep people reading. And, in fact, that's the wrong idea in writing action is to start with just crazy frantic action where we don't know who anyone is or what's going on, because that actually has a pretty high chance of losing readers. It's not to say it's totally impossible to start with some kind of action-based scene. You, you can, but you're trying to pull in readers um, by finding something interesting that and starting to give them a, a sense of your voice on the page and the unique writing style that you'll be using and zeroing in on a point of conflict, even if it isn't necessarily, you know, this car is trying to smash that car. We're trying to pull in the right readers and the kind that are going to enjoy the entirety of the book that is to come. And so that to that end, we don't want to start with something that misleads them. We're trying to set the right expectations in terms of your voice and tone, the emotionality of the book that they're about to get into. Like, is this a sad book or is this a funny book? Things like that. And then last, in terms of simply genre thrills. We need to know what your genre is and why people read it, what the appeal is of it, and how you can start to either deliver on that right away or you can just make that promise that you're going to deliver on that and sort of reassure them that they've bought the right thing that is going to give them the kind of experience that they've signed up for and that they've paid for. Okay, so that's just the basics on opening hooks. We're going to break down more of these aspects, uh, or we'll break these down into, um, you know, subcategories and things like this. Let's look at just some examples of types of opening hooks. So we might start by describing something unique and noteworthy about the setting or the time. And I think one of the most famous ones of these of all time is going to be um, Charles Dickens. Again, it was uh, the best of times. It was the worst of times. And that's going to be from Tale of Two Cities. And um, I have a couple Dickens examples today. Um, but yeah, so this is an 1859 novel that starts out by simply describing the, the place where the story is set and all the interesting contradictions about it. You know, it's the, the best and it's the worst. It's a time of poverty, it's a time of excess. You know, it's like kind of all these contrasting factors that seem to, to directly contradict each other. And that sort of does start to draw interest from the reader. That's what we mean by conflict a little bit, which we'll get into more in a moment, but conflict in a book isn't necessarily always gonna be, you know, Jackson wants to kick open the door and Cecily wants to hold the door closed. It can sometimes be things like, oh, I wonder why they're describing this place in, in terms that don't make sense. Or I wonder why um, they this, this character seems to be making a decision about something and can't choose. Or it might be something like, um, I wonder what, like the conflict might be something more along the lines of the author has given me a hint of something interesting, but hasn't explained what it means yet. And I'm going to keep reading to find out what the answer to that thing is. So largely opening hooks are going to come down to this prospect of you're setting up questions and you might be answering some of them to begin with, but ultimately you're setting up questions that the rest of the book is going, you're going to need to read the rest of the book in order to learn the answers. We might start with character. You might highlight something interesting about the characters. In this case, with Harry Potter, we have Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive. We're proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much, which is kind of the opposite of something interesting about the characters. It's sort of saying, there's nothing noteworthy about these people, but I think that we know that this is sort of hooking you in to make you question the fact that, wait a minute, if most people aren't proud to say they're perfectly normal, the fact that they're so outwardly declaring that they're normal might in fact be indicative of the idea that something is very not normal about them, or else why would the author have chosen to start with it? So you can sometimes do that, where it seems like you're doing the opposite of highlighting what's interesting, but in fact, you are drawing the reader in to sort of question what you've just said. And here's another example of the questions. What about the opening line of Charlotte's Web? We have, where's Papa going with that axe, is the first line of that book, in quotes. It's dialogue, right? And that So you can raise a question in dialogue. 
Or you can raise a question just as the author, as the narrator, whether your voice is omniscient or whether it's taking on the sort of tone and character of one of the character of one of the people in your story. You can always simply articulate a question to begin with. Something that might be a theme of the book. It might be like, what is the measure of a man's life? Or what is the cost of lies? Or something like that, right? Or it might be something that the characters themselves are asking or wondering, which is also sort of, this is also kind of an example of in medias res, where we are beginning in the middle of a scene. In medias means in the middle of res means the thing. So in the middle of things. Here's a very famous one. Uh, this is from A Thousand Years. Is it called A Thousand Years of Solitude? A thousand years of solitude. Hundred. Hundred. Hundred years of solitude. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> that's the sequel. Oh, that's the sequel. Is this the right? Oh, is this the... No, I was, this... I was joking. I was... Oh, okay. The sequel. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, um, quite another quite famous opening line. As he, many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. So we're start, sort of starting right in the middle of things. I mean, we start with the words many years later, which sort of says, okay, wait, there's a, there's a separate timeline from the kind of current, like, reality of the, or from the current present, you know, stream of the narrative. As he faced the firing squad... Uh, this colonel was to remember it that distant afternoon. So this is sort of saying there's three separate timelines, right? We have the present, we have the many years later, and then we have the distant afternoon when he was a kid. So this is sort of setting up that expectation this is going to take place all throughout this guy's life. Um, and it's also in the middle of a scene, right? Like we're sort of left to wonder, first of all, why is this guy getting firing squatted? Second of all, who is this colonel guy? And third, discover ice. Like most people know what ice is, so I wonder what circumstances would lead... A, you know, this this seems like sort of a significant moment in his life if he went to go discover ice, and it clearly left enough impact on him that he's reflecting on it as he went to go get executed, right? So we're left with all these questions from this opening line, um, and we keep reading to find out the answers. It's really as simple as that. Um, any questions so far just on the very basics of opening hooks? This is sort of really looking at first lines. Okay, no questions. Thank you for linking that Nacho in the chat. Has Nacho has linked us uh, the first page of Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Talos. Um, let's go to our next page here and let's talk about this idea of conflict. So normally a scene is going to look like this. A conflict scene, as we envision them, um, is going to be someone wants something, they try to get it using interesting or appropriate tactics for their character, they struggle with various obstacles in attempting to get that thing, they succeed or they fail, and then this changes something for the overarching story, and we've usually progressed closer to or further from that character's larger goal. Now, your opening scene, your opening page, it can have that. Like, your whole, your opening page could, in, th in theory, be one complete scene that sort of follows all of these different beats. And in, in fact, Dwight, Dwight Schwain in the Techniques of the Selling Writer book defines a scene as a unit of conflict. So, but the thing is, in, in books, we're not always in scenes. Um, you're kind of, there's sort of two separate modes of writing, one where you're in a scene and one where you're not. And I call the times where you're not in a scene, I call that floating, personally. Um, I'll get more into this in a little bit. Um, for now, I want to just make sure that we understand the idea that conflict is not always going to be one person wants one thing, one person wants another thing. We can have this conflict of ideas in books that does keep people reading. You know, like, is the conflict here? He's trying to get out of getting firing squatted? I don't really think so. The conflict is really the readers are leaning in to say, wait a minute, why is that guy getting firing squatted? And we're going to keep reading to learn. So readers are looking for conflict. We're reading for conflict, which should permeate all these different styles of hook or, or opening page. A contradiction, like think of it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, might ask you, well, how could it possibly be both, right? Or something that doesn't seem like it makes sense on the surface. There's another book that Nacho got me recently, um, which is called Red Sister, a fantasy book that opens like this. When killing a nun, it is important to bring an army of appropriate size. Well, okay, that tells us, wait a minute, nuns must not be what I'm thinking of. In this world, nuns must be incredibly powerful or monsters or, you know, killing machines of some kind, which will intrigue readers to find out the explanation. Characters, remember that the characters show who they are through unusual choices. We open a story like Die Hard with the main character is a tough cop who he gets on a plane and he's terrified suddenly, right? It's, well, it's not really a choice, but we see that the characters doing things that are slightly not what we expect 
are, it's sor sort of analogous to the author making choices that we might not expect as well. So we're looking for unusual choices in both the characters and the authors that will define them and set them apart and make us go, ah, that is this unique perspective. So let's uh, grab a book and read us the first page. Anyone can feel free to chime in. Go ahead. I got Harry Potter here. Go ahead. Okay, sorry for background noise. So You're the good. first chapter was called The Boy Who Lived. Here, Shanti, let's um, walk and talk. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four, Privet Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large mustache. Mrs. Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion, there was no finer boy anywhere. The Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. Awesome. Nice job. That, that's the end of the first page. It n ends very neatly right there. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> Isn't that a great hook? Um, so it starts with something kind of okay. banal, right? Like we're describing people that describe themselves as very normal. Um, and we sort of learn different facts about them that are evocative and very visual, but they still seem pretty normal, right? They have super thick necks, which comes in handy because she uses it to lean over fences and spy on their neighbors all the time. So we're learning about a very unpleasant couple and their son whom, whom they consider to be the best kid ever. But then towards the end, can you read that last part one more time? Sure, one second. <clears throat> the Dursleys had everything they wanted, but they also had a secret, and their greatest fear was that somebody would discover it. Nice. So that's how you you can you can see these first couple paragraphs is like this is boring. I thought this was a fantasy book, right? But that that description of banality at the beginning, or that description of just everyday life in these characters, that could be your next door neighbors. It's kind of grounding us in a world, and then. I like how this book doesn't kind of overwhelm us with too much magic stuff right away because we're going to be learning about these things at the same time that Harry does. And the fact that they tell us they have a secret and it's their greatest fear that it be discovered tells us it's something very high stakes. And it's something that, although they claim that they're normal, most normal people don't have a deadly secret that their greatest fear is that it will be revealed. So clearly, the fact that they've said, the, the omniscient narrator has kind of cheekily said that they were normal is asking us to keep reading to find out how that's very much not the case. Anything else you noticed about this opening page? There's a cartoonish vibe to it a little bit with the big necks, like, you know, there, these ex sort of exaggerated features mm -hmm. that I noticed. I don't know if it's on the first page, but I was rereading, like, the first few pages the other day, yeah. and I noticed that. It's good for kids in middle grade books to give them very, very clear visual indicators of what the characters are like, whether you compare them to something or whether... Because kids, like, if you tell them, like, she was a stout woman who spent her time lingering in doorways, then that's, like, that works for a literary book. But are kids going to know what to picture for that or what that means exactly? Not necessarily. That's Whereas... If, linger in doorways. That's yeah. so funny. Or if you say something like, she looked like a bird with an arched back or something like that, kids are going to be able to grab onto that much more easily. Anyone else? Things that you've noticed in the first page of Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling? There's always, like, an edge to it, and in a way that's, like, you can see that they're leading up to the question, or leading up to, like, a question, or, like, the statement, like, they have a secret, because they keep describing how absolutely normal they are. Mm -hmm. So you, you can sort of tell at the beginning that they're not very normal, there's something up here. Right, exactly. And that is conflict, in a way. Even though we're not in a scene, the characters aren't trying to do something that's being opposed by someone else. But there's a conflict in terms of we're being told that they're normal and we're seeing that they're not. There's a contradiction at play here that we're going to keep reading to find out about. Somebody else want to go? Go ahead, Emily. Yeah, I was going to say, too, it's like super fascinating after reading, because I, I read the book seven times growing up. And then in the last year, I read them again as an adult. And they're much more terrifying and, and full of... Uh, uh, conflict and, and, and they're just more scary than I remember when I was younger. But also um, with the Dursleys, they are absolutely terrified. 
they're actually very scared that other people will find out. So they are trying their darndest to act completely normal. But then at the same time, like through all the books, I mean, but then at the same time, they're like really not normal people. Like they hold their son to the highest esteem and she sneaks, you know, will spies on her neighbors and stuff like that, which is not really that normal, you know? So it's very interesting. They're like not actually normal. And then also they have this secret. And they're so scared. It's interesting like seeing how it's painted right at the beginning. And then that holds every summer with Harry. And it's just like this very important thing that's that's um begs you this question of why are they not normal and how does that relate to Harry and the magic world and stuff? It's so interesting. Right, right, for sure. Cause because we've seen the cover of the book, we see there's a kid flying a broom on the cover. So the whole time we're gonna be wondering, well, how does this relate to what we kind of have a, an idea that the book is about already? Um, and that's not always going to be when you're working with a work in progress, you don't have the benefit of a cover or marketing or anything like that to hint at what is going to be in the book later. But sometimes the fact that you are describing or that you start on something that seems to be the opposite of what the readers expected can draw them in. So starting a fantasy book by describing normal people can be interesting if it feels like there's more to the story that we don't know yet. And it feels like it will be worth our time to learn the answer. Let's have somebody else read a first page of a book. Just grab something. I have uh, the Gentleman of Moscow here. Okay, go ahead. 1922, an ambassador. At half past six on the 21st of June, 1922, when Count Alexander Ilyich Rostov was escorted through the gates of the Kremlin onto Red Square, it was glorious and cool. Drawing his shoulders back without breaking stride, the Count inhaled the air like one fresh from a swim. The sky was the very blue that the cupolas of St. Basil's had been painted for. Their pinks, greens, and golds shimmered as if it were the sole purpose of a religion to cheer its divinity. Even the Bolshevik girls conversing before the windows of the State Department store seemed dressed to celebrate the last days of spring. Hello, my good man, the Count called to Fyodor at the edge of the square. I see the blackberries have come in early this year. Giving the startled fruit seller no, tell no time to reply, the Count walked briskly on. His waxed mustaches spread like the wings of a gull. Passing through the resurrection gate, he turned his back on the lilacs of the Alexander Gardens and proceeded toward Theater Square, where the Hotel Metropole stood in all its glory. Reached the threshold, the Count gave a wink to Pavel, the afternoon doorman, and turned with a hand outstretched to the two soldiers trailing behind him. Thank you, gentlemen, for delivering me safely. I shall no longer be in need of your assistance. Those strapping lads, both of the soldiers, had to look up from under their caps to return the Count's gaze. For like ten generations of Rostov men, the Count stood an easy six foot three. On you go, said the more thuggish of the two, his hand on the butt of his rifle. We're to see you to your rooms. In the lobby, the Count gave a wide wave, which to simultaneously greet the unflappable Arkady, who was manning the front desk, and sweet Valentina, who was dusting a statuette. Though the Count had greeted them in this manner a hundred times before, he responded with a wide-eyed stare. It was the sort of reception one might have expected, arriving for a dinner party, having forgotten to don one's pants. Passing the young girl with the penchant for yellow, who was reading a magazine in her favorite lobby chair, the Count came to an stop before the potted palms in order to address his to address his escort. The lift or the stairs, gentlemen? The soldiers looked from one another to the Count and back again, apparently unable to make up their minds. The stairs, he determined on their behalf, then vaulted the steps two at a time, as had been his habit since the academy. On the third floor, the Count walked down the red-carpeted hallway toward his suite, an interconnected bedroom, bath, room, and grand salon, with eight-foot windows overlooking the lindens of Theater Square. And there, the rudeness of the day awaited. For before the flung-open doors of his room stood a captain of the guards, 
with Pasha and Petya, the hotel's bellhops. The two young men met the Count's gaze with looks of embarrassment, having clearly been conscripted into some duty they found distasteful. The Count addressed the officer. What is the meaning of this, Captain? All right, thank you so much for that. Great job reading that show. Um, this is um, probably a couple pages on the layout of, of most books. I think th this looks like it was drawn from the E version of, of the book, which means that it kind of yeah. it kind of like scrunches the text together a little bit and would give us a bit more, but, but that's okay. This, this still gives us a good sense of like what you're doing in the first few pages of a book. Um, so I think question, I have not read this yet, although Nacho did buy me a copy, <laughs> but I haven't read it. Um, but I think that we can start to see a couple questions. First of all, I thought this guy was going to get executed, but I think we're seeing that he's being escorted by soldiers to be kept in house arrest. Is that right, Nacho? Yes. Okay, so he's being kept in, like, a hotel, I suppose, near Red Square, and we don't know why. He seems to be some kind of intellectual. Um, he is a, a count, so he's, you know, minor royalty of some kind, or not royalty necessarily, but a count isn't, you know, a, a historical title, which means you're in charge of a county, um, so this is uh, a, a mystery, a small mystery. What is this guy in trouble for? We start to see the voice of the author play out here a little bit too. We start to see a little subtle sense of humor um, in the descriptions and the, the simile and metaphor being used, you know, the sort of reception one might have expected when arriving for a dinner party, having forgotten your pants on, um, forgotten to put your pants on. So we're sort of getting a, a sense of the author's voice and the little things they notice and the details they choose to highlight. Anything else you guys notice here? I mean, one thing that um, seemed interesting just, you know, the first time reading this was, like, the relationship with the people working in the hotel mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of his authority for the communist soldiers, right? Like, even though they had authority over him, he they were used to him telling, to someone like him telling them what to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like, he's you know, deciding, oh, well, we're, okay, the stairs. Um, and he's very, like, kind of uh, charming. I mean, he's, like, arrogant but charming, right? Like, in, in yeah. a way, it, it's really interesting if you read through the whole thing, like, the, the transformation he goes through, you know, in this book. Certainly not your normal terrified prisoner being shuffled along to their quarters, right? Um, he has a bit more personality and authority than that and yeah there's that definitely might ha grab a reader and make them wonder how did this guy get in this state what did he actually do to get in so much trouble questions like this um, I have a question. I... go ahead oh. at what point do we realize he's being arrested i didn't get that in the first half you know half of this page well, for me, it was just when it said he was escorted and because he's a count and this is, you know, 1922 Soviet, like, okay. communist revolution. So they're confiscating all the property of, like, the nobility and all the rich people are, a lot of rich people are being, like, arrested. And Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that, but I guess I'd find out at some point. I, also, I think that the fact that he talks to it, so at the bottom of the first sort of column of paragraphs here um he turned with a hand outstretched to the two soldiers trailing behind him he talks to them for a second and then one of them is keeping his hand on the butt of his gun right which they wouldn't have done if they were es like he refers to them as his escorts but um it's clear that they are the ones in charge he says on you go we'll see you to your rooms so i think that that was what hinted to me that he was actually n they weren't escorting him in the tr traditional sense there they're we escorting go. him yes. into captivity yeah. Yes, yes, that part. That's where I would have figured. Yeah, I was just focusing on the first half. But yeah. Yeah, it. it doesn't give it away in the first couple of paragraphs. You have to wait till the third. Um, I think I I enjoy how he's like describing the scenery, taking it in while he's getting arrested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell. Kinda, I I just ahead. think, yeah, I I just think that yeah, like you said, it's it's very he's very calm about it. He did. He's just like, ah, let's appreciate life for a little bit mm -hmm. while he's, like, um, getting ushered away. Yeah, if the character was terrified and was fighting for his life, we may not have lingered in these details in the same way. 
because these are details that you would only notice if you were taking your time. I, I really like racism. The count walked briskly on. His waxed mustaches spread like the wings of a gull. Like that, that's not someone who's frightened, right? Like that, it's yeah. just such a weird little description. I, I thought even the first paragraph, like before I even knew he was being arrested or any of the context, the fact that he says at half past six, I, you, it's kind of echoing what you said, at half past six on the 21st of June, 1922. And like, everything's kind of pretty. I'm like, okay, what bad thing's gonna happen? Like yeah. something, like you wouldn't have been this specific about this time, like something's gonna happen. Right. Or, you know, yeah, that, that stood out to me. If it was just like, he bought a newspaper one time, we may not have said like at half past six at 0300 hours on the 21st of June. Like right. we would have just right. been like one time, you know, <laughs> it seems important. I and I, I feel like just maybe, you know, growing up in the West or like not, I, I mean, like just the, the word Kremlin sounds a little bit scary, right? Like escorted through the gates of the Kremlin. That sounds really bad, right? That doesn't sound That's like so. a pleasant thing. It rhymes with Gremlin, which makes it extra scary. Um, This was great. Let's do one more. I think somebody in the chat, um, Christiana said she has a nonfiction book. Or a memoir? Yes, it's called An Unquiet Mind by K. Redfield James Jameson. Go for it. Prologue. When it's 2 o'clock in the morning and you're manic, even the UCLA Medical Center has a certain appeal. The hospital, ordinarily a cold plotting of uninteresting buildings became for me that fall morning not quite 20 years ago a focus of my finely wired exquisitely alert nervous system with the I'm not sure how to pronounce this word vib, vibrisse quinging antenna perked eyes fast forwarding and fly faceted I took in everything around me. I was on the run. Not just on the run, but fast and furious and on the run. Darting back and forth across the hospital parking lot. Trying to use up a boundless, restless, manic energy. I was running fast, but slowly going mad. The man I was with, a colleague from the medical school, had stopped running an hour earlier and was... He said, impatiently exhausted. This, to a saner mind, would not have been surprising. The usual distinction between day and night had long since disappeared for the two of us. And the endless hours of scotch, brawling and fallings about in laughter had taken an obvious, if not final, toll. We should have been sleeping or working Publishing, not perishing. Reading, <clears throat> reading journals, writing in charts, or drawing tedious scientific graphs that no one would read. All right. Thank you so much for reading that. What was the name of that again? An Unquiet Mind by K. K. Redfield Jameson. An Unquiet Mind. All right. Perfect. So um, I think that this starts us off with a scene pretty quickly. This is sort of her describing a mental health incident in which she goes to the UC was it the UCLA hospital that she said. Um, so that yeah. one, and it begins with when you're manic. So it's sort of saying the main character here or the narrator has some kind of insight to share about like this is the theme of the entire book. It's going to be me talking about this mental health condition that I personally have or have had in the past and things that I've learned about it, and things that I'm going to now unspool to you if you continue reading. What else do you guys notice looking at these questions here? Um, what questions are raised? Um, what is the tone and voice? Go ahead. I think that it, she describes it very vividly, like extremely vividly. Like uh, there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, the way the way that it's worded, and I think. I think it's kind of pretty. <laughs> it's very pretty for such a traumatic experience. 
yeah for sure that's yeah, that's a lot that's the the tone and the voice here is not one that is going to like it, it seems like it's going to use sort of literary and poetic language to talk about a very traumatic ugly thing or maybe not ugly thing but a, a very traumatic unpleasant incident yeah well, that's all <laughs> thanks for that anyone else have comments All right, and there's there's links to both of those in the chat. Thank you, Nacho. Let's keep going. Let's talk a bit about the difference between floating around in a book and then actually settling into a scene. I'm not going to read the whole um, uh, excerpt from this book, probably, but I will just want to talk about this idea a bit. So how is a scene in a book different from a scene in a movie, a play, or a TV show? And those in, in my novel class, about six weeks ago, we talked about something similar to this. So in visual media, we're always in a scene, uh, except for some very small exceptions. In a book, we're doing something I call floating when, until the author deliberately settles and grounds us into a scene. So imagine if an author starts a book with some sentence like, you know, cats are the worst animals, um, and they just talk about their opinions on animals for a while. We're not in a scene, right? It's not like, yesterday I was at the store and I saw a cat and it attacked me and I, that's why I hate them so much. It might just be the author talking about their opinions or talking about memories or talking about a dream or describing something or hinting at what is to come or any of these other things. Like there can be set up before a scene, digressions within the scene, and reflection after the scene. So in books, you, you do have to sort of figure out what your scenes are. And to that end, we have to ground the reader in the reality of that moment, like in using our sensory details in terms of the place that they are the time period that we're in, the people that are there, descriptions of those people, and all that stuff. Like, we want to be giving concrete details so the reader can know what to picture. But before we get to those scenes, we're floating. And we have to kind of narrow the scope as we float around until we find a scene. And then it's like, again, I mentioned the camera sort of craning down until it focuses on something interesting. So um, this is just the opening of Great Expectations by... Charles Dickens, which I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it opens with this our main character. He's a kid named Pip, just talking about his name. He mentions talks about how he got his name. Um, he gives uh, he mentions that um, you know his father decided to call him this, um, and you know uh, my Christian name was this, and this is why I decided to call myself this. And then he uses that to transition into talking a little more about his family. I never even saw my father or mother. My first fancies regarding what they were like were unreasonably derived from their tombstones. So this kid never met his parents, and by the time he was old enough to remember, he only ever saw their gravestones. So we're not in a scene yet, are we? But we're starting to find one. The gravestones and the tombstones is what's transitioning us into that moment next. So we, although we start floating, we're starting to drift down through the sky and find a cemetery, right? So the third paragraph is a transition from talking about the his life and the place generally to where Pip is now at this very moment, and it's going to help us find the scene. So we're going to transition from just this floating into direct and concrete uh, conflict in action. And he starts by describing the setting now. And so this is the third paragraph. Ours was the marsh country down by the river. So we're starting to actually be able to picture things. It's not just the main character talking about stuff. He's actually putting us into a moment in time. <clears throat> so... Um, uh, he describes just the surroundings, you know, the nettles around the churchyard, the bleak overgrowth and all this kind of stuff. And then at the very bottom of, of this uh, paragraph here, he takes us to him right now, or right now in terms of just the narrative time, right? So the low lead line beyond was the river and, the dis and that the distant savage lair from which the wind was rushing was the sea and the small bundle of shivers growing afraid of it all and beginning to cry was Pip. He's referring to himself here in the third person, describing himself as a bundle of shivers. And then a guy jumps out and threatens to cut his throat with a knife. And that's where the story kind of, that's our first scene that just gets going. So you might think of old fashioned, like older books in the Victorian era or before even as taking a long time to get to the point. But I mean, Great Expectations paragraph three has a guy jump out and threaten to kill the main character with a knife. So I don't think you can, like we, we can look at the, the, the floating as getting us to the scene um, and that's its main purpose. It, should all, it also has other purposes that it needs to serve, like telling us about the characters and building up the world and um, other you know, very important stuff too. But um, by the time we get to the scene, it, it hits us with something very attention-grabbing, something with high stakes and something immediate and urgent right at the bottom of the third paragraph. So despite the fact that we did start with floating, 
we've pretty quickly found our scene in the cemetery. We zoomed down through the sky to find Pip, our main character, and that is where the action of the book begins. And from here, like the scene proceeds in the moment. Like we're not—he's no longer just talking about his past and his name and his history and these things like that. We are—we are in it, and uh, the story has gotten going. Um. So, uh, any questions on this idea of f the difference between floating and scenes? Like, how do we kind of narrow our scope and focus until we sort of center the narrative camera on a scene? All right, let's move on. So I hope that this is clear and how it, it should just, I hope it makes sense that we're not always in a scene in a book, but by the time we settle into one, then you still got to grab the audience pretty quickly. So changing from broad to specific and concrete story details creates that sense of movement. You know, we start from, here's my name. Here's a little about my family. The first time I saw them was on their tombstones. Oh, let me tell you about that time with the tombstones. Then the scene begins. That creates that sense of forward motion. It's like binoculars or a telescope finding an interesting subject. So you can use this to try to give us just enough setup and then focus in on the interesting subject, set the stage and push things into motion. We don't want to spend forever just floating and talking about the leaves and the, the history of the world and the past and grand philosophical ideas. We need to get to a scene eventually. And different books have different ways of approaching this, but um, you know, with more popular fiction as opposed to literary fiction, we like to get to scenes quicker. You can start a book with, with something that just is a scene. Think of Charlotte's Web, which we mentioned before. That just opens on a scene in the middle of it. Or you can give us a couple paragraphs of something about the world, the character, something to draw us in and keep us reading. Tell us what the tone is going to be. Tell us what the experience of reading this book is going to be. But you only want to do just enough that we can that we understand the scene that is to follow. All right, so I've got examples here, and I'll need volunteers to read these first pages. Um, and we have a few different genres. Um, I wanted to look at different angles and how different authors approach this. So we have a literary book with a kind of a bit of a mystery, um, Dogs of Babel. We have um, Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, with, which is its own kind of weird mashup of genres, but you might describe as war, sci-fi, and sort of autobiographical. We have The Ritual by Adam Neville, which is a horror book from 2011, which there's a movie uh, adaptation of it on Netflix. And we have Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, which is a Western from 1985, uh, which is considered one of the great American novels and is uh, really just kind of a dense and literary Western that is um, absolutely incredible and mystifying. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if anyone really understands all of this book, um, except for maybe university professors, but I think that Cormac McCarthy's writing is just this amazing combination of very, very arcane and very approachable, sometimes both in the same line. So I think it just set, is an interesting example of voice. All right, so we will need a reader um, who would like to read out one of our pages for us. I can read. Great, okay. Which one of these would you like to read? I'm interested in Blood Meridian. All right, let's do it. Right. So let's um, so, open on that one. <clears throat> this is, I'll just give you the brief synopsis of this. This is inspired by historical events in the 1850s. This is following the journey of a character just called The Kid. He's a 14-year-old Tennessee kid who stumbles into a nightmarish world when he joins a ruthless gang of scalp hunters on a journey to Mexico. That's kind of the all you really need to know. I'll give you a little bit of context just so you understand this first page, because I think it's tough to understand the first page without this context. But the novel's protagonist is born in 1833 during something called the Leonid Meteor Shower. So if you don't know this, the first page is hard to understand. Um, but his birth is littered with various omens of his violent nature. The meteor shower is considered the first of these omens. It's an astrological sign, which is, you know, named after the lion. Um, so let's read our first page. Go ahead. Okay. See the child. He is tall and thin. He wears a thin and ragged linen shirt. He stokes the scullery fire. Outside lie dark, turned fields with rags of snow and darker woods beyond. That harbor yet a few last wolves. His folk are known for hewers of wood and drawers of water 
But in truth, his father has been a schoolmaster. He lies in drink. He quotes from poets whose names are now lost. The boy crouches by the fire and watches him. Night of your birth, 33. The Leonids, they were called. God, how the stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens, the dipper stove. The mother dead these 14 years did incubate in her own bosom the creature who would carry her off. The father never speaks her name. The child does not know it. He has a sister in this world that he will not see again. He watches, pale and unwashed. He can neither read nor write, and in him broods already a taste for mindless violence. All history present in that visage, the child, the father of the man. All right, thank you for that. A lot going on here, as you can tell. I mean, Corm Cormac and Carthy books are all like this. Um, and uh, I think we can... Um, I'm, I'm going to leave this up for a moment, just if you guys need to reread this back. But we're going to go back and maybe ask some of these questions, like, what promises are being set? What are you noticing about the, like, the, the language itself, the tone and the voice? This does not sound like most Westerns sound. And what are we setting up in terms of expectations for what the story is going to be about? Anyone can feel free to chime in. I'll leave this up for like another minute and then I'll scroll back to the qu text questions. Go ahead, Lasagna. Okay. I, again, like, the language was very pretty, very poetic. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking, to be honest. <laughs> That's I right. just thought that it was very really poetic this time around. For sure, yeah. So, oh. Cormac McCarthy books are all written in this kind of uh, pseudo, or well, I guess not all of them, but a lot of them are in this kind of pseudo biblical style, where like we'll go from text, some text that feels like it w it could have been written by anyone. It's like he ate a can of beans, and then the next line will be something about all of human history and humanity, like all wrapped up into that one can of beans, you know. So it kind of vacillates yeah. between very simple and relatable and that, very, very literary and arcane. Go ahead. Describe I was just going to say that's a great um, description of him. Yeah. <laughs> can of beans can in, can one, of in one line. Yeah. Go ahead. Describing them as like the father, the, the son, or the kid, the boy, like, I guess that adds to the whole biblical feel. Mm-hmm. And it was honestly very soothing to listen to, despite them being like, he already has a taste for violence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This there's is some, very fun. There's, there's some really good audiobooks of his stuff as well that I, I recommend looking up, especially The Crossing, which is probably my favorite of his audiobooks. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else, feel free to chime in. What do you notice? How is this setting up expectations? What do you think this book is going to be about? This, to me, takes a lot of creative freedom. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be very rule-breaking and maybe would be considered disjointed, very disjointed. And it actually reminds me of the first page that I wanted to share a lot in a lot of ways. Which page did you want to share? Sorry. Oh, where we... Um, it's uh, the first page sharing, which I oh, guess the, is... the one that you already, you already did it? No, I haven't. Oh, you have it. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll have more time towards the end, I think. if we, We'll see how much time we have after giving feedback um, to everybody's first pages. But, um, yeah, we sh we'll, we'll see. Uh, thank you for those okay. comments, Aliska. Um, any, uh, anyone else? This, this one's a, a, a toughie. I mean, there's whole books written about this book so it's okay if you're like what on earth so let's go back and find our list of questions for analysis 
what happens? Is it a scene or is it narration? Well, I think in this case we have uh, a scene is how we start out, don't we? See the child, he's sitting by a fire. Um, outside it's dark and the woods are, or, and the fields are snowy. Um, his father is drunk next to the fire and the kid's just watching him. So we are starting with a scene. Um, and then we kind of have this sense of conflict and we're, it seems like um, we're describing that uh, this kid seems predisposed to violence in some way. I mean, we haven't seen any examples of that. He's described as pale and thin and ragged. He, he's described as like a little mouse crouching by the fire, right? But then the narration seems to be telling us, like this is what we did with Harry Potter, right? Where the narration's telling us one thing and it's showing us another thing. So we're wondering like, wait, what? How could that, how could those things make sense together? How could you describe a little kid cold by a fire and tell me that he's born in violence? He, it sort the book sort of accuses him of killing his own mother right here, doesn't it? Where it says, the his mother incubated in her bosom the creature who would carry her off. So it's sort of saying again and again, this little innocent kid is going to grow up to become this monster. And that is kind of suggesting for us what the trajectory of the whole story is going to be, right? Any other... Uh, questions here that I want to go over um the tone, yeah we I think we went over the tone and voice much more kind of um uh complex and literary than a lot of other westerns are um and just this promise of there's gonna be violence in this book the main character we're gonna be watching how he changes and how he becomes this person that we've promised he's going to be that is how we keep reading or keep the reader going all right yeah, um, I was gonna say go ahead. it seemed like the, I was just gonna mentioned it seemed like that was kind of the biggest um dramatic question that line at the end about um violence mm -hmm. uh i can't remember why but yeah um in his in him broods already a taste for mindless violence like that that is sort of really makes me want to keep reading to find out like how does that brooding in him and what's like it's sort of like a little mystery. Yeah, for sure. And also, I think we're setting the promise that this story isn't just going to be about itself. This story is about all of humanity, all of history. All history present in that visage. Visage means face here. It's sort of saying that in this kid's story, you can find the story of humanity writ large. The child, the father of the man. You see how the kid's dad and is passed out drunk next to the fire, and the kid is forced to kind of become the father of his own dad. Go ahead. Yeah, and he really sort of plays with grammar, right? Or he's mm -hmm. kind of like playing with how you're structuring a sentence. Like, you know, the child, the father of the man. Like, like normally that doesn't really make sense, but the way it's written, actually, yeah. You know, and his other line about, um, you know, uh, outside light dark turned fields with rags of snow and darker woods beyond that harbor yet a few last wolves like what are you know like it just it, it, this is someone who's like um kind of like having fun with the language mm -hmm. like immediately you kind of get that right for sure yeah Cormac McCarthy he not only kind of I guess you could say quote breaks literary rules he he makes his own rules um and is considered to be one of the greatest living writers because of it and lit literary fiction is a genre where it's about pushing the boundaries of the language itself and doing new things with it. Let's read another page. We have a horror book, we have a literary book, and we have a Kurt Vonnegut book, uh, sort of about World War II. Um, who would like to read next? I'll read one. Okay, which one do you want to read? It doesn't matter. I'll read anything. Let's read the horror book. So, we're okay. going to be reading the first page of The Ritual by Adam Neville. Here's a brief synopsis. This came out in 2011. A traumatized man and his group of university friends encounter a pagan cult in the Swedish wilderness, and they must escape the creature they call Mother. And there is a movie of this, too, which you may have seen. It has a cool monster. It's worth watching. Um, let's check out the first page. Go ahead, Dan. And on the second th day, things did not get better. The rain fell hard and cold. The white sun never bro thro broke through the low gray clouds. And they were lost. 
but it was the dead thing they found hanging from a tree that changed the trip beyond recognition. All four of them saw it at the same time, right after they clambered over another fallen tree to stumble into more of the scratching bracken. They came across it, breathing hard, damp, damp with sweat and rain, speechless with fatigue. They came to a halt, bent from the weight of the rucksacks, bedding in wet tents. They stood under it, looking up. Above them, looking beyond the reach of a man standing upright, the dead thing sagged between the limbs of a spruce tree it was displayed. But in such a tattered state, they could not tell what it had, had once been. Thank you for that. And I just left a little definition on here. If anyone had to look up what bracken means, it's a tall fern with coarse lobed fronds. Um, so there you go. Um, let's talk about this one. What do we notice? What promises are we setting? What expectation are we setting? What do we think the book is about? What's the voice and tone like? I, I love how it just starts that in the middle like on the second day things did not get better like yeah that's a great opening line like it's like whoa okay so what what happened yesterday yeah we had been hoping like, things would get better after the first day yeah so it's already kind of a little sort of got my interest and and then it was the dead thing that changed the trip well, whoa like how is this going to change the trip right like what's going to like it just it's setting up so many um kind of little questions that i for me it feels this is definitely something i would keep reading to find out yeah me too thanks nacho i feel like for the tone they're not leaving anything up for like interpretation they're very overt with it kind of like that very um, gory gory details that, uh -huh. yeah gory details that they're describing they're very upfront with it instead of just leaving it um vague or mysterious or something like that sure yeah good point horror novels are going to go into a lot of gory detail more than most books will and not only the sort of gore of, you know, blood and stuff like that, but they also will go into a lot of detail on the scenery and the surroundings, and they can describe almost anything in a creepy way, which is the really cool thing about horror novels as, as opposed to horror movies. Like, we don't have cinematography in a book, but you can describe, like, someone just sitting on a bench in a creepy way if you do it right. Or you can describe, you know, like, the withered and blackened tendrils of the trees. Or, like, you can just pick words that evoke fear and unease and dread in order to sort of act as that cinematography. And you can make anything creepy if you just pick the right words. Mm. What do we think the book will be about? I know I gave you the synopsis, but just based on this, if you didn't read the synopsis, what would we think is going to happen in this one? Or what promises are being set up? Well, they keep describing the dead thing, I assume. Um... Well, I assume that the dead thing isn't, like, a normal thing. It's got to be something pretty abnormal. If they're not describing exactly what it is. Right, yeah. So, so I'm thinking that there's a mystery, you know? I'm thinking that there's a mystery, and they're going to, like, discover something more about this dead thing. They're going to know exactly what it is sooner or later. Sure, or we might ask the question, what put it there, right? I mean, what... It, it, yeah. And it, I think that... Um, First of all, we might imagine that the characters just can't tell if it's a human or not. It's just so ripped up up there in the tree. And then second, so we're going to ask what is possibly capable of doing that. And second, who is respon like who is responsible for it? Who put it there? So it's sort of, yeah, it's like a murder mystery. There's a body here. Who put the body there? And we're going to keep reading to find out who's responsible for this. And I guess we're sort of saying the characters are lost, so we can only anticipate that they we're setting the expectation that they're going to come into conflict with this thing, and they're going to have to survive it. Or else they're going to end up, you know, pinned to a tree as well. Mm -hmm. Anything else you guys notice here? Maybe this... there's going to be more about 
the preceding events for the second day as I'm kind of wondering what happened the first day. Sure. Yeah, we're asking this question or making the readers ask the question, how did they get into this situation? What, like, if things did not get better, did bad things happen on the first day too? I wonder, you know, what led up to this? That's always sort of a yeah. free question you get by starting in medias res, like in the middle of a scene. You can, the audience is always, of course, going to wonder, well, how did we get here? Go ahead. Yeah, it's also like very clear that this story, it's not just about like the mystery of this dead thing, but it's going to be like, how do we survive in this wilderness? They're probably, you know, really far from civilization in this, you know, wherever they are, it's like, it's, it's a, it's, it's a hard life, right? Like maybe this was a meant to be a fun vacation, but they're breathing hard. They're speechless with fatigue. They're carrying these heavy rucksacks, wet tents. I mean, it's not a easy, you know, they're in for a rough time, basically. Sure. They're definitely in for a rough time. Thanks, guys. Um, so we have uh, two more to read. Um, I think we might do one more. Maybe we can take a digression and um, uh, maybe summarize our main points, and then we'll move on to our feedback on pages that people want to share from their own works in progress that I mentioned we'll have some time for. So let's get one more reader. And they can pick either Dogs of Babel or Slaughterhouse-Five. What's the other one? Uh, it's this one here. Oh, okay. Um, I want to... Can I read that one? You want to read the dog one? Okay, sure. So, um, this is a literary book with a little, a bit of a mystery plot, although I, I wouldn't exactly call it a traditional mystery, um, from 2003. So, this is the synopsis. So, a linguist's wife is found dead in his backyard, and he attempts a series... This is the real premise. He attempts a series of scientifically dubious experiments to teach the only witness of her death, which is the family dog, how to talk. So he's going to try to teach the dog how to talk to tell him details of how his wife died, okay? And in piecing together the details of her death, Paul uncovers more about her last day, and he remembers events throughout their life that led up to it. Um, and you'll notice that literary book synopses often kind of sound like this. It's like, he uncovers and learns more about this and must come to terms with this and must juxtapose this and this, and it's all very kind of like about ideas. It's not really a super riveting mystery plot where he's like, I need to figure out who the killer is before he kills again. It's not like that at all. So don't think of this as like a super traditional mystery. This is more like a literary book where the main character has a question he's trying to answer, which is, why did my wife die? And he has a kind of unorthodox way of doing it. Ultimately, I'll spoil it. No, actually, I won't spoil it how it goes for you. Um, let's just read the first page. Okay. Go for it. Uh, here's what we know. Those of us who can speak to tell a story on... On the afternoon of October 24th, my wife, Lexi Ransom, climbed the top of the apple tree to our backyard and fell to her death. There were no witnesses save our dog, Lorelei. It was a weekday afternoon and none of our neighbors were at home sitting in their kitchens with their, with their windows open to hear whether, in that brief mid-air moment, my wife cried out or gasped or made no sound at all. None of them were working in their yards, enjoying the last of the warm weather, to see whether her body crumpled before she hit the ground, or whether she tried to right herself in the air, only whether, or whether she simply spread her arms open to the sky. I was in the university library when that happened, doing research for a paper I was working on for an upcoming synop uh, symposium. I had an evening seminar to teach that night, and if I hadn't called home to tell Lexi something interesting I'd read about a movie she'd be wanting to see, uh, then I m might have taught my class, gone out for my weekly beer with my graduate students, and spent a few last hours of normalcy, happily unaware that my yard was full of policemen ne kneeling in the dirt. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. So, um, we don't get to... We mention the dog, but we don't get into the talking dog stuff until 
far later. And that's actually, if you frame that up front, that sounds like that's going to be really like the crux and focus of the book. But it's much more about this guy just trying to piece together why did my wife die? Um, was it like, what are the emotional reasons why? It's not like who murdered her and how do I catch them? It's more like I need to understand. Um, so let's say what we noticed. What did we learn? What expectations and promises are being set? What is the tone and voice here? Go ahead. I, um, I enjoyed how it just, the way he feels, you can really tell the way he feels about it because he's like describing his normal day and he's just like, why did my wife die? How did this happen? Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm interested to see what happens next because I want to know like how he's going to, how he's going to react to it, I guess. Sure. Yeah, we can tell he's telling the story from sometime in the future, so he already knows what happened. But at the same time, he's flashing back and he's going to be, like, we settle, we start in one scene, and then we move very quickly in the second paragraph to another scene, which is sort of like the current moment of the story. Um, and that's where we get started, where he's in the library, he's going to find out about this stuff. Although the, this first paragraph is from that sort of future perspective, we quickly get into his kind of current perspective. Um, and so we might expect that, yeah, we, we, we don't know how um, our main character is going to react when he gets home and finds out the truth. Um, we're sort of continuing to read to find out how this unfolds. Yeah, I'd like to see him spiral, like, because he's going to teach a dog how to talk, so I'm wondering how he gets to that point. Right. Good point. Anyone else? Let's look at our main questions. Uh, okay, so first of all, we have this question of what happens. And here we had two scenes. I think they're pretty clear what happens. One, a woman falls out of an apple tree and dies. Two, a guy is in a library. He gets a call from a detective that his wife, or he it mentions that he's about to get a call from the detectives that his wife has died. So what's the, uh, what's the conflict here? The conflict is that he doesn't know how his wife died, I guess. Doesn't know how or why, and he wants to find out, and so do we as the readers. Yeah, and like it, it seems like it's not just like the mystery of who killed her, but like he really wants to know all these details about what her last moments were like, or something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah, he thinks that will like clarify for him the motivation behind it. If he knows, because he mentions, for instance, like, I don't even know if she yelled out. Was it an accident? Like, was she trying to climb up there and she just fell down? Did she do this and did she fully accept it? Or did she plan to do this for a long time? He wants to know everything. Yeah, I guess this isn't really mentioned here, but maybe it's sort of suggested that he's wondering if she killed herself. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, that is, he does imply that, doesn't he? Um, whether she crumpled before she hit the ground or whether she tried to right herself. Like, did she, if she did try to kill herself, did she regret it halfway through? And did she change her mind? And did she realize it was a mistake? Or was she accepting it? Was she open to it? And was she ready for it? Like, kind of, he's trying to make sense of his life with her. Like, did he, you know, not understand what she was going through or something? Like, more than just, you know, who's the killer? Right. So he's holding her ransom. Uh, he picked that name, I think. Lexi Ransom. Holding her ransom? You mean like metaphorically? Yeah. You know, it's like he's not letting letting it go. You know, it's uh, something that is going to drive his entire existence. That's a good point. Yeah. And we could look at it as sort of saying that he maybe feels like he himself is kind of captured or kid like you know metaphorically has been is in the captivity of this this question this this not knowing is keeping him a prisoner in his own life mm -hmm. thanks for reading this nice comments everybody let's look at a summary of our major points so far and let's recap and conclude just like the crux of the lecture and then we'll have time to look at student pages for feedback. And if we have more time, which I'm not sure, we have 35 minutes or so, then we can do the first page on Slaughterhouse Five, which is just a fantastic book. Okay, so let's sum up everything that we have talked about so far. First, promise. 
You're offering a promise to your reader, an interesting piece of insight or information that you will unspool if they continue to read. So if you open the book with something like, my father told me the best piece of advice I'd ever gotten. I think The Great Gatsby opens a little bit like that. Um, Then that kind of asks us to keep reading because we want you to explain what that insight is. You've given us a preview of what is to come and you've told us, sit down, keep reading, and you'll learn this. Next, you can introduce a compelling character. Either your ma- it could be your protagonist, it might be your antagonist, it could be anyone, but you might showcase their unique perspective or tactics or voice. And often voice is going to be the key that is going to keep people reading, especially if we look at middle grade and YA. Um, then voice is um, usually considered to be more important than plot. If you have a person that ha- is an interesting and fun enough voice to read, then it doesn't really matter what they're doing because anything will be interesting. You can paint a picture in your reader's mind that fills them with questions that they'll feel compelled to answer. So promises and questions are really at the heart of what makes a great opening page, right? And last, we can showcase your unique writing style, whether or not that is the character's voice, in which case, if we're doing it like a first person narrative, then it could be that your character's writing style is also, or your writing style, I should say, your writing in the style that that character would speak. So in that case, it's gonna be one and the same and your writing style is going to be also showcasing their voice. Um, Or it might be that you are taking on the persona of a very specific character, and we're going to be showcasing, like, what are they like? How are they different from most people? What unusual choices do they make? What are their unique tactics or their thoughts on things? Or how do they see the world? And also, if if you don't have that narrator or you don't have that character, then you're sort of omniscient narrator. Um, We're going to be asking, how do you see the world? How are you going to be writing about it? All right, I want to pause and open the floor for questions on anything we've talked about so far or any of these main points to summarize what makes a compelling opening page. Do you guys have a favorite opening page or a favorite book that you can read us the op- or you can tell us about the opening page and what really hooked you? Maybe not. Okay. Well, we will go to feedback. So um, go ahead and post a link in PDF or Google Docs in the chat if you have a first page that you'd like to review right now. All right, thanks, uh, Christiana. And Amanda says she'll post hers in a second. I might need to just kind of quickly format this one. Um, Where's the paragraph break here? Is this it? Oh, wait, no, it's here. Okay, is that right? Did I space this out correctly, Christiana? Are you here, Christiana? Yes. Great. Okay. Does this look Let right on the see. page? I'm I'm looking. One second. Okay. Sorry, one second. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, would you like to read there's it? Or some do you want... of it... Go ahead. Uh, there's some of it cut off at the end. Yeah, I can, I can scroll down. Um, do you want to okay. read it out loud or do you yeah, want someone else to? Somebody else. That would be nice. Okay, volunteer <laughs> reader. I kind of... Can I? Sure. Let me zoom in okay. a little bit for you here. I'll just read it on Discord, is that okay? Sure, that's fine. Okay. As my bare feet gently touched the forest floor, 
I looked up to the midnight sky, sprinkled with sparkling diamonds. I could feel the cold air enter my lungs, the damp dirt beneath my feet. As I glimpsed a snake in the grass, slither past me. Off in the distance to my right, an astonishing portal opened, beaming with bright, fiery white light. She who holds the keys, the goddess stepped forth, her fierce eyes gripping mine in moonlight and blaze of the portal. At this time, I knew why she had come. It was time to face the underworld, what lies beneath my shadow. Time to embrace the part of me that not even I wanted to see. Time to face my demons. Uh, Hecate? I hold the keys to unlock mystery. Do you dare to enter this realm? She was sensational, an unexpected surprise. Suddenly gravity hit me. She was no savior. Instead, she handed me the tools to chisel away at my shadow, my darkest self. I had no idea what was in store for me. My wounds were being opened, old wounds of the past. Why is it that when I, uh, when I bled so profusely, my heart would not cease to beat? My sorrows engulfed me, yet I felt alive. I had been asleep for far too long. Hail Hecate, goddess of the crossroads, and mystery. She who holds the keys. We are the keeper of the keys. We hold her secrets. Great. Thank Hecate. you for reading. Oh. Uh, Christiana, can you um, maybe tell us a bit about what's going on here and what the book is? Um, well, it's it's not a book yet. I, I was considering writing one, but I just didn't know where to start. So... Oh, Huh? Um, what is it if it's not a book? Is it a short story? I, yeah, yeah. Okay, anything you want to right? tell us about what's going on in the in the scene? Yeah, it's just in, encountering this goddess who's more of a darker goddess and having to be faced with things that, that I don't even want to see within myself like my shadows um my darkest self so just ex like shedding light on that and um just some of the fear that creeps in to shed light on that part of myself um when you say myself you're, yeah. you mean the character right or are you saying that you yourself are the main character in this yes which one? I'm the person that's walking through the forest. By that you mean the book is written in first person or this is like an autobiography? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you don't know if this happened to you or not? <laughs> what do you mean? No, it it didn't happen to me. It's it's um I guess you could say it's not, it didn't really happen. But I'm like envisioning myself as the character and then Hecate talks. She says she holds the key to unlock mystery. Okay. So you're saying this is sort of a, a self insert main character where it's I think Slaughterhouse Five is sort of similar where you are sort of imagining yourself in a fictional situation. Yeah. Okay. I think Thank I understand you. now. Um, okay. So in terms of feedback, and this is uh, the feedback portion, so I'm happy to provide that. And anyone else in the chat can also weigh in on whatever they, they, their thoughts are. Use the, um, the chat. Just mouse over the classroom channel and click on that small white word bubble that comes up. Um, my first feedback is that I'm a little confused, by, or I was a little confused by this. Um, didn't quite understand what was going on at first. I think by the end, I started to sort of piece together what was happening. Um, there's a bit of redundancy in a lot of the lines here. I mean, for instance, when we say things like old wounds of the past, that's like saying the same thing twice. We could have just said wounds of the past or old wounds. Um, and so maybe just do a pass when you when you're editing, make sure that we're not just restating the same thing and then saying the thing again, my shadow, my darkest self. Um, and then there, there was one more moment on here that I felt that we were just sort of saying the same, something then restating it. Um, I'm not sure what else I wanted to highlight there. But in, in any case, um, 
I think that this is setting the expectation that the rest of this book will follow your main character is maybe going into like a hell dimension or something like that, or maybe diving into their own past magically. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say that, yeah. The okay, so a goddess appears to realm. the character, opens up a portal and says, go through here and I'm going to show you your demons in this realm or I'm going to sh take you on a journey that's going to show you what's wrong with you. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, I guess I did understand. Um, I hold the keys to unlock mystery. Unlock the mystery? Do you dare to enter this realm? She was sensational and unexpected surprise. So a surprise is always unexpected. Um, that was the other thing that I wanted to look at. Unexpected surprise. Um, so, uh, she, she handed me the tools to chisel away at the shadow of my darkest self. So the main character seems to know what's going on here. The fact that we don't really know what's going on here makes it a little tough to fully wrap my head around as we're reading this. Um, so I get the feeling your main character might be a wizard or something, or, or like some kind of time traveler or something along those lines. Someone who knows about goddesses and knows exactly what they they're capable of and what they're offering her. Um, so if that's not the intention, then you might want to have your character, in fact, not know what's going on. But this has almost like a dreamlike feeling to it. So I think that sort of might have been more along the lines of your intentions. I could be wrong. Um, yeah, but... you're right. It does. It does. Okay. Um, so can I ask why did you format this dialogue with just the character's name and then like a colon like this? And then are these are character are, are characters saying the stuff at the end in all these different lines here, or is this like your character thinking, or I'm just wondering how you're formatting the dialogue here. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I did it right. I I'm just a beginner, so I don't really know what I'm doing. Okay, well, because you've read lots of books before, I imagine, so we know that mo most books it'll be like this character said this, right? Or if it's in present tense, this character says this. So we might say something like, you know, I hold the keys to unlock the mystery. Do you dare to enter my realm? She said, right? Um, is there a reason you wanted to deliberately not do that? No. No. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so, yeah. Um, in that case, I would, if the, these things, they're not actually rules. That Like, we, we were just reading passages a minute ago where... The author was doing very crazy stuff that breaks normal conventions of grammar, but you should generally know why you're doing that. Um, so I guess to begin with, most of the time we are writing dialogue uh, with the character will say a sentence, then it will say she said or says. Said being the best word to use for the most part. We don't always have to use some fancy word. Um, so it would probably, I would split it in the middle like this. I hold the keys to unlock mystery, she said. Do you dare to enter this realm? And we go down to we would space down then to the next block. So every time a new character, a new speaker starts, then we should indent down to the next paragraph. And then oh. I guess these lines at the end, I wasn't quite sure, is a character saying this out loud or is this just narration or is the character thinking this or what's going on there? So you can sometimes use formatting to help delineate that a little more. Um, you can use italics, for instance, if it's just the characters like thinking or interjecting what we call free and direct speech into the middle of a... a yeah, uh, that's... That would be it. That's what you're thinking. Yeah. Okay, I'd probably put these in italics then. And then when she says, we are the keeper of keys, we hold her secrets, I wasn't sure what that meant or who the we is referring to here. Is your ca main character... That's the main character talking. Yeah. Okay, so what is what this referring to? Character. So is your main um, character like a part of like an order of wizards followers. or something? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah her followers. Her followers. Okay, so your main character is familiar with this goddess already, and maybe even intended to run into her? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, so there wasn't much in these first couple paragraphs that kind of told me that that was the case. I mean, at, except for this one, I knew why she had come. I mean, your character says it was time to face the underworld, but that kind of makes me wonder, is, is your character intentionally summoning the goddess, or is she dying? Or what exactly is happening here? So maybe you could just, like, Give us a little more context. Um, because if we just open in the middle of a scene with a bunch of mysterious things happening that we don't understand, then it can sometimes overwhelm the reader and make us wonder, wait, did I miss something? Mm 
Um, let's um, see. The, so, oh, go ahead. No, I don't know what to say. That's Sorry. Okay. So we have some uh, comments in the chat as well. Um, Emily says, in relation to the first paragraph, I'm wondering why they didn't name those things slash why they weren't known for doing so. Oh, she has to go, so she can't explain the comment. That's all right. Thanks for coming, Emily. Nacho says, it felt like a bit more setup establishing where we are and what's happening could help orient us before the portal appears. Yeah, I agree, actually. So it, I think if we start um, our first scene or our first page with something that we don't have to spend too many words explaining what's going on. Like, we, we read the ritual, right? And it's about some guys on a camping trip. It doesn't actually require too much explanation. But if we start with your character having a spectral experience with a god coming through a portal and the character seems to know what's going on, it might help to have a little more setup to ground us in the world and let us see kind of where are we and when are we and what's happening before we get to the strange, extraordinary events. Because then we're going to have a sense of what's weird and different and what's supposed to be seen as normal. So maybe consider okay. adding an another paragraph before all this starts. Okay. Thank you. Sure. And then I think we have w one more comment from Lasagna. I didn't really understand what was going on. I think it's a figurative manifestation of your thoughts, if this is supposed to be you. There were some commas in odd places. The language was a bit confusing. Um, oh, no, you weren't interrupting, Lasagna. Thank you. That was very useful. Um, so, yeah, feel free to scroll through the chat if you want to see some more comments left by the rest of the readers. And hopefully this has given you some, some things to think about. Just we need to be grounded. We need to know what we're kind of looking at a little bit. And if your character knows something that the audience doesn't, then you should generally do that for a specific reason. Like we're deliberately withholding it from the audience. If we do it long enough, though, or enough crazy things happen that we can't keep track of, we're going to start wondering if we've missed something or if like, was there a prologue that we were supposed to have read or, or something like that. So I guess just maybe try not to dump like too many questions on the reader at once. If we're just left wondering, wait, what even just happened in that scene at all, then we might kind of be thrown a little bit off the book, off the narrative of the book. Okay. So try for clarity, concreteness. So just be really concrete. Make sure we know when and where we are and what's happening and like, what are the surroundings and does like if your main character, for instance, seems to know more than we do, maybe just a line or two where she would say like, you know, as a wizard, I know all about goddesses. Something like that would even help us know. Oh, OK, she's a wizard. There's lots of things she knows about that we don't know yet. Might just help us kind of realize what we're supposed to know and what is supposed to be mysterious. OK, thank you. Sure. Thanks for sharing. Um, we have time for a few more. Um, do we have one from we have one from Aliska and one from Amanda? You can you can save me for last. Okay. Because I've I've yeah. Aliska, you want to start? Okay, it's kind of long. Let me um, go through it really quick. So wait. Or um, just do like. Let me yeah. Let me just ask a quick question. So if this was a a published book, I guess we might ask. Where, where would the first page actually end? Because, like, it, if you're writing on Google Docs or in Word or something like that, <clears throat> we're writing in 12-point font, 8.5 by 11 pages, so that's actually way longer than a first page would be. So maybe pick, like, the first three or four paragraphs or something like that, and just pick a logical spot you think that the first page in a published book would end. Okay. Um, I wrote this in 2013, and I got through... Um... I think 32,000 words the last time I checked. I know that was a long time ago, but it is kind of important to me. I want to finish it someday. Okay. And I think I did post it there. Yep, I've got it here. Yeah, okay. So um, four lives collide during investigation into uh, of a terrorist plot okay so 1994 simple strong compact he swings the weapon over his shoulder and then almost in slow motion brings it up and out placing the buttstock tightly against his left shoulder he scowls rotates his head halfway around peers deliberately through the notch on the rear sight and aims toward the beech tree marking the path to the expanse of forest spreading out behind our house he transfers the weapon from one hand to the other, twists his arm up, allowing it to separate from his arm, then catches it again. Proper sight alignment. You try. He transfers the rifle into my hands, the impersonal shape of it in my cold hands. I try to perform the action exactly like him. 
but my hat falls over my eyes, forcing me to, to forcing me to adjust it on my head. Should I just stop right there? Because sure, I can go, yeah. Okay. So I mean, I played around with all kinds of beginnings because there's potentially all kinds of beginnings for this, and mm -hmm. I I don't know. It's just hard to make decisions, you know, with this stuff. Sure, that's okay. Um, so maybe tell us what is the genre of this book and, and what is the whole thing about? I guess it's like a military or paramilitary creative nonfiction or something like that. <laughs> I know we always go through this stuff with the genres with me. Um, well, based on true events, but fictionalized, right? Mm -hmm. As um, this uh, 1994 um, the first invasion into Chechnya. This is a Chechen family that's learning, uh, become, you know, fighting uh, is becoming a part or has been for the last hundred, hundred years at least a part of the Chechen culture. But it's specifically um, here in the, in the 1990s when um, the Russians invaded twice Chechnya. The little boy is being groomed to, um, to fight and um, so 10 years later, uh, it's showing him as one of the chief uh, oper operatives at the Beslan school attack event. So that occurred in 2004. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going to um, be involved with three other people uh, throughout the course of the book um, from very different cultures than him, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's... I don't know. I want. I have a vision for the work to be a very, um, like, is humanistic the word I'm looking for? Just um, showing the, uh, not trying to create any kind of sympathy for people that kill people indiscriminately, or maybe it's not so indiscriminate. That's the thing that I'm trying to um, write about in the book, that there's always a precursor. Um, evident and you know when these things happen it's normally not uh you know violence for the sake of violence and so just kind of um placing humanity and people from different cultures on the same plane so to speak to kind of say you know there was something that happened before this it wasn't just as terrible as this uh, as this event that occurred you know the Beslan school attack I think it was 2004. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, um, a significant event, um, a terrible thing that happened. Um, and so just um, to say, well, this these are the things that may have uh, been contributing factors to something that horrible happening, you know. Okay. Um, Trying to make sense of it know. with context then in that case. I think so. Cool. So I think this is generally pretty well written. Um, the uh, There's not a, a ton of detail on the characters, which you can deliberately do if you want to withhold that for some reason, but maybe just a little more detail on the people here would be nice. Um, we don't have any description of, of either of them. I'm assuming they're brothers, maybe, because it says behind our house. Is that right? Oh, okay. Okay. I wanted it to be a father-son. Oh, father-son. Okay. But I, I didn't get that across, I see. Um, it does need a lot of work. I had major um, uh, interruptions into uh, in my life when I started writing this. Mm -hmm. I, I was supposed to finish it, and it just never happened. That's why it's been 10 years now. Gotcha. Um, and then, of course, I have a lot of different projects that I want to finish. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Well, we have I didn't want to bore you the same stuff. It's it's okay. Yeah, we have a we have a novel boot camp coming up if you're looking for just organization and structure and just write a book 101. Um, but let me just comment on this while we have it. So yeah, um, if this is a father and son, I didn't get that just from these, just because there's no clues. Um, and I think that you can maybe just by describing the characters a bit, just a few words here and there, like um, you can even if you don't want to explicitly describe these people here, just tell us what is the dynamic, what is the relationship. Um, this. Uh, to me, I was assuming brothers, father, son makes sense as well. Um, and then I think that we make a tense mistake on, we, we switch from 
there's yeah. we go from pa present to past tense. A burst of cold air sends pins and needles through my scar and through my spine. Asymmetrical flurries of ice settled themselves. It should be settles themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had a problem with um, I this is not uh, just exclusive to this work. I have a lot of issues with the tenses throughout mm. my work, and it causes a lot of problems because once you make that mistake, it's really hard to go back. You know. Sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, it yeah, you gotta make sure that everything is in the same tense, or or if there's a reason, if if you do change tenses, there's a reason. Like for instance, we start in present tense and then we flash back. And then in the flashback chapters, maybe as past tense, you can get away with stuff like that. Um, but in general, yeah, we don't want to avoid going from present to past in the same paragraph. Um, the words themselves in the sentence structure was quite nice. I just wanted a little more voice and d detail. So I would want descriptions of the characters, maybe even just a couple things here and there. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, and then uh, in terms of the promises that you're setting, I think this is going to be about your, and tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you're setting up this is going to be about an inexperienced soldier and maybe his journey into becoming a veteran soldier or a more experienced soldier. He's Because we're starting him off, he can barely hold a rifle, his hat's falling over his face. And then is this journey of the book going to be him becoming a soldier? A proper one? It's going to be him uh, performing the tasks of what he's been trained to do, which is basically doing terror Mm -hmm. And the people that have been um, pl placed in charge of stopping his actions. And there's also, I don't know if you guys remember um, reading a script that I started writing um, featuring a Pakistani woman who um, was abused. Um, I started writing the screenplay that goes with this story. Um, so there is a woman who um, is disfigured that's involved and um they he comes to terms with um who he really is in the grand scheme of things he doesn't want to do these terrible acts anymore um and he starts to realize that um through uh meeting the pakistani woman and the two other individuals that he's um that he doesn't have to do these things you know and that he can be what redeemed um after the the terrible some of the terrible things that he does do um sure. that perhaps there is redemption available for him um okay. but i don't know because i only got thirty two thousand words into it and it's i think it's very convoluted i have the idea and the vision for the work in my mind but i feel like i'm gonna be 100 years old by the time i finish it or you could finish in 12 weeks with our boot camp that starts February 18th, but <laughs> I won't. I could try. You could try. <laughs> but I already have plans for the other one, you know, the um, 1,000 years to finish that, if I can make it into the class, Sure. you know. Understood. Um, so I'll just say, last couple, last comments on this, um, that the, um, th the writing is working well. I think that if you want to create that sense of mystery and, and intrigue and like have us keep reading, Think of how you can bring that out a little more. Think of how you can, like, of course, this would depend on the perspective that your character is telling the story from. Like, if they're telling this from the perspective of the future and they know everything that is going to happen, then they could give us these little hints, like, you know, he he loaded the rifle that I would use to do terrible things later or something like that. I mean, or just, um, it doesn't have to be that extreme. It could be something uh, that just makes us ask a question. I mean, the only question I'm kind of wondering right now is, who are these people? What is their relationship? And I guess, why are they training with a rifle? But lots of people train with rifles all over the world. So it didn't, it doesn't like necessarily make me lean in and go, I have to see what happens next. Does that make sense? If you, whereas if your character was like, I, you know, I'm no good with a rifle, but I really need to get good with a rifle fast. Then something like that might start to draw me in and go, I wonder why he needs to get good with a rifle fast. Or I wonder why he feels that this is necessary or something like that. I'm, I'm looking for a point of tension and mystery. Okay, and it is that he wants to please the father, of course, right? So, um, and be a part of this identity, the Chechen identity, you know. Mm. Okay, I think you can definitely yeah. bring, bring, try to bring that out a little bit, even if it's even okay. if it's just hints here and there in these first three paragraphs. Like, you know, I, I, you know, I could barely hold the rifle, but I needed to be a proper Chechen, so I did as I was told. Something like that. Um, Thanks. Yeah, just make us want to answer questions, and by wanting us to answer questions, then you'll keep the reader engaged. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, Aliska. Okay, um, I think we had time for, was there one more person who wanted to share something? Amanda. I might wait until the next, um, the next um, pilot class, uh, pi uh, pilot class, novel class starts. Okay. Um, just because, yeah, I, my brain sort of started turning off and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be able to register feedback right now. So, okay. That's all right. Good to recognize that being the case. And you can, yeah, you can save it for the next novel writing class if you want to. Um, so let's, I suppose we'll open the floor to questions and comments on anything we talked about today, anything we didn't get to, any opening page questions that you have yet to have resolved, things that you're still wondering about. Anyone can feel free to use the chat or unmute your mic and speak out loud. If there's no questions, we will wrap up and I will remind you of the boot camp that's coming up. First class will be on the 18th of February. We're going to write a whole book. You can refer a friend. You'll both get a free month of subscription. And let me leave you on the list of free events coming up soon. Hope you guys enjoyed this class. I mean, um, this is one of many that we have on the server, and we're gonna. If you're interested in stuff like this, stick around on WordCamp and check out ScriptCamp too. If you're interested in writing for feature film or TV, or short films or other things on screen. And try out our other servers, too. If you like this model of instruction, you like this type of class, stay on Discord and just head over to our other servers that have classes, like Toon Camp, which has classes Tuesdays at 3. We have coding classes for programmers. Um, that's going to be Sundays at noon. And we have plenty more coming up, too. Thanks, guys. Hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. And for members, we have Writer's Lab later today. So you can come by. It's like office hours that you can... At, with your subscription, you can uh, come by and ask whatever questions you want and get feedback on up to five pages of your work, and, and whether it's work in progress or something finished, whether it's outline or pages from a script. Um, that's a great place to come and uh, just get all of that resolved. So uh, we hope to see you there and have a great rest of your